So researchers at Washington University looking at this problem said, okay, we need to start a new. They, they canvassed the, the literature and they said, we really don't have any validated disorders. Uh, and, and the way you validate disorders are by genetic connections, by long-term outcomes, different presentations of symptoms, etc. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to gather together people that present with the same similar symptoms, and we're going to start to research those groups. So we're going to have diagnostic categories that will help us research, and hopefully, now with this research criteria, it will lead to some understanding and some validation of disorders. So literally, they're saying. Uh, we're, we're going to start anew. We do not have a good diagnostic manual. And you'll see when they proposed this, they proposed about 16 categories. This is the scientific impulse. It's absolutely a valid impulse, okay? It's trying to say, let's learn more about the, how people present with different symptoms. Next. But there's also going to be a guild impulse. In other words, psychiatry is a guild with a profession to protect its own interests. That's going to be present in the 70s. And the guild impulse, uh, sort of easily summarized, is psychiatry felt itself under attack, under threat. They, you can read their documents and they say, we are threatened with extinction. We do not have a good standing in society. We're sort of a laughing stock in many ways. And so here's how it sort of boiled to a crisis. There were studies showing your diagnoses are not reliable. That was a problem. Then there were studies that showed that their form of talk therapy, psychoanalysis, was no better than other forms of talk therapy in terms of effectiveness, which made insurance companies begin to question them. You had ex-patient groups who were coming out of hospitals and organizing themselves into, listen to this, psychiatric survivor groups. In other words, they weren't helped by mental hospitals, but they survived the experience. <laughs> and, they, and the famous book was a book called On Our Own, We Don't Want Anything to Do with Psychiatry. So you can start seeing all these threats. There was an academic anti-psychiatry movement that came out of at the academic environment who said, uh, really, psychiatrists form more, more as a social police than as doctors. So there's all these threats to the psychiatrists, their, their standing in society, their image in society, their sense of self-worth as doctors. And then the key moment was an experiment done by uh, Rosenhan, a psychologist at Stanford University. He sent him, he and I think it was seven of his students, or eight of his students, presented themselves to mental hospitals around the country, and they said this. I'm hearing a voice that says one word, thud, or hollow. That's it. They all got admitted to the hospital. Once they got admitted, they started behaving absolutely normally. And they were all diagnosed with schizophrenia, and they were all medicated. Now, he writes a thing saying, you can't even distinguish insanity from, from sanity, but the real kicker of the story was, none of the staff ever recognized the people as imposters, but the patients did. The patients said, come on, you're faking it. So this was humiliating, and literally right after that, they convened an emergency meeting and the American Psychiatric Association said, what are we going to do? And as they, they canvassed the, you know, the environment, they said this, what is the image in society that has such great respect? It's the infectious disease doctor. It's the doctor in white coat, right? That cures uh, and, and bacterial infections, etc. So they're facing a crisis. It's See, they're threatened with extinction, and so go ahead next. <coughs> so the solution really is this. We are going to present ourselves as doctors in white coats, and literally they started saying, wear a white coat. <laughs> uh, no, it's true. And even today they do. <laughs> is, and, and we're going to be saying we're treating diseases just like infectious disease doctors treat diseases. Okay, like illnesses, bacterial illnesses, etc. And now you can see this. This is from a former director of the NIMH. As they're preparing DSM-3, he says, can you, you can't read this, can you? I'll just read it for you. There is a boundary between the normal and the sick. So you have wellness and you have sickness, right? Under Freudian ideas, that's not so. There's this, there's this spectrum, okay? It is the task of scientific psychiatry as a medical specialty to investigate the causes, diagnosis, and treatment of these mental illnesses. This is their st putting their stake in the ground for a new paradigm of care, a new narrative right here. But you see the problem is, there has been no scientific discovery leading to this. They haven't discovered the biology of any disorder. 
and they really don't have validated, you know, research, etc. Distinguishing one from the other, but they're saying we this is the new story we're going to present. Okay, next. So, the, if you go back to that research criteria, which is the scientific book, they had about 16 or 18 initially sort of domains that they were going to study. But as they began to put together DSM-3, they had this sense. We need a diagnosis, an illness, for everybody who comes to see us. So that person going through a divorce who's not doing well now needs to be diagnosed with an illness. Maybe the child that's not doing well in school needs to be diagnosed with an illness. So next thing you know, and literally, if you're on the DSM-3 committee, you just start to get making up whatever disorder you want. And the symptoms. So there's no real science. They literally got together small groups and said, if you're going to be the symptoms of a disorder, and you've got to have three of these, or six possible ones, they were constructed is the point, and they created now one 265 disorders. And I like to say that you can read DSM-3, DSM-4, and DSM-5, and if you're not in the book, I check out to see if you're breathing. Because <laughs> everyone can find themselves there. So this is Nancy Andreasen. She's editor-in-chief of the American, uh, she was the longtime editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry. She, in 1984, writes a book called The Broken Brain, which is a I don't know if any of you remember this book, it was a very popular book, and it is the moment that, that presents this new narrative to the public, the lay public. It's not about psychological problems. It's not about really the trauma or whatever may have happened to you. It's not even about normal things that happen to human beings. People who have, who integrate three, they have broken brains. Okay? They have an illness. And you'll see here, the major psychiatric illnesses are diseases. They should be considered medical illnesses just as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are. The thought was that each different illness has a different specific cause. And now they say there are many hints that mental illness is due to chemical imbalances in the brain and that treatment involves correcting these chemical imbalances. This is going to be the narrative that is presented to us, okay? And we're going to organize ourselves around this narrative. Next. So. What is the guild interest here, once they decide this is how we're going to present themselves? Well, they, in essence, have products in the marketplace, right? the therapeutic marketplace. The first is, they're going to say, we as doctors are going to set the diagnostic boundaries of these diseases. Okay? So diagnosis becomes one of their, they have authority over that domain of our lives. Next, they're going to say, we're going to have authority over the research into the biology of these diseases, because, of course, we're doctors. And then finally, uh, what, how do you, what's going to be the primary treatment of diseases? It's going to be drugs, right? So this is going to be what the ordinary person, the product, the ordinary psychiatrist is delivering. Oh, by the way, if we go back to the 70s, when there was this competition in this medical, this therapeutic marketplace, so if you go back to the 70s, there were a lot of people offering different types of care to people struggling. There were psychologists, social workers, alternative I'm sure there was plenty of alternative approaches, in Sedona, that sort of thing. And as, as um, the American Psychiatric Association surveyed that therapeutic marketplace, they said, what is our, what do we have that the others don't have? And we have prescribing privileges. And they literally talked about, uh, this is what's going to save us because we can offer something they cannot. Now, you better have good drugs to make those prescribing privileges worthwhile, right? So basically, they're going to have to tell a story now that says these are real diseases, right? Uh, we're learning more about them, and we have drugs that treat those diseases. And the minute they publish uh, DSM-3, they begin pouring more money into a public relations machinery to start telling that story. They set up a new department of public relations. They begin reaching out. They hold annual media days. And if a media person does a good job about telling this new story, uh, they got an award from the American Psychiatric Association. They did uh, campaigns to inform Congress of this. And by 1986, the Pulitzer Prize in medicine was run, won by someone from the Baltimore Sun who basically summed up this new story. He said, the advances are incredible. We are discovering the molecules that cause schizophrenia, the molecule that causes depression, the molecule that causes kids to misbehave, and they're fixing it, and these psychiatrists it's called molecules of the mind. Are getting so expert at this 
the real worry is maybe they're going to be able to give us designer personalities. You're going to go to your doctor and say, well, I want to be an extrovert, or I want to be an introvert. That was the message being told in the 80s, okay? So that's an econ guild economy of influence that is present with the publication of DSM-3. Now there's a second econ go ahead, next, economy of influence that arises with this new disease model. Who is so happy? As Robert Spitzer, who was the architect of the DSM-3, said the pharmaceuticals were delighted, and here's why. If you go back before 1980, there was of course some understanding that there were drugs to be used, antipsychotics, for people in hospitals. There were some antidepressants, but believe it or not, there was fewer than 1% of the population taking an antidepressant in the 70s. The benzos were the popular drugs at that time. But what they saw with DSM-3 is, you know all the stuff that hits ordinary people? The setbacks in life, it's called sometimes the walking wounded, that we all hit at some point. They understood that these are going to be the new market for drugs. And that they could work with the American Psychiatric Association to, in essence, pathologize so much of what is normal because now we can bring the normal into this marketplace, okay? So next, now what I'm going to do is, uh, is just chart some of the, to, to show you this economy of influence that began to arise in terms of money going from the pharmaceutical industry to American Psychiatric Association and individual psychiatrists. So you see in 1980, they had a, a American Psychiatric Association as an association that had about 10 million in annual revenues. About half of that came from member dues, okay? The minute this happens, they start, the um, pharmaceutical company starts giving money to the American Psychiatric Association for all sorts of things. To fund their educational campaigns, uh, you know, put ads, of course, in their journals, so if you go to the annual conference, you could go to the annual conference and you go to the exhibit floor and there'd be these extraordinary exhibits and lots of free things, that sort of thing. But anyway, you can see, and then as new drugs come in, pharma even increases its, 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 its money it funnels to the association, atypical antipsychotics. So what happens here? Why does it begin to drop here? What happens is, as Senator Charles Grassley begins reporting about all this money going to the psychiatrists, saying it's corrupting psychiatry, and sort of as a, and they pointed to the exhibits at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association as an example of this largesse, this sort of bribery. He makes this public, and so the APA then says, uh-oh, we have a problem, and now they phase out. Oh, I, I, I left out something really important. They phase out industry-supported symposium. What does that mean? What happened in 1980 is something so incredibly significant. So if you go before that at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, pharmaceutical companies could have uh, you know, their, their exhibits, but they weren't allowed to sponsor scientific presentations. Okay, there was a wall up. But with the publication of DSM-3, the American Psychiatric Association said, we will now begin to let Eli Lilly or Pfizer put on scientific symposiums, so they're not presented as advertisements. And now they're gonna hire people from Johns Hopkins and Harvard to give those presentations, the latest research on validating this disease or that drug, and these became the most popular parts of the by the pharmaceutical. So you start to see this uh, method of promoting delusions, because in fact all the psychiatrists out there, they're thinking they're getting scientific presentations by Harvard University, Stanford University, and they're really not paying attention to the fact that this, these are paid presentations, okay? Now, what happens here, that was seen as one of the corruption, so when this does this APA thing, it's gonna to try to say we're gonna be separate from the pharmaceutical industry, they vote to phase out those industry-funded symposiums. It came because of Charles Grassley's sort of... I know, uh, anyway. You are in some voice of my hearing voices. <laughs> I could have swore I heard something. There's medication for that. <laughs> but my point is here, this was really done for public relations. It became a public relations problem to have this out there. Next. So, 
this is just an example of, of, of how they began paying money for it. So they would you know, present the scientific symposium. This is real key too. If you go to an American Psychiatric Association meeting, more than half the people there are psychiatrists from all parts of the world. Everybody there is on a pharmaceutical grant. So they're paid to fly there. They come and they're wined and dined. They usually go on a trip, you know, some sort of out outings. And this is how it gets exported to the world, this new medical model. And they did it very effectively. Um, they would do media training programs for psychiatrists. So beginning in the 80s, the American Psychiatric Association said, we need to get together and tell a uh, coherent story. So they, they set up media training programs around the country to tell psychiatrists how to talk about this new narrative. That media training was funded by the pharmaceutical companies. Um, you'll see that they began doing PR campaigns that have been on ever since, and that those PR campaigns say this. These, these are real diseases of the brain. They're under-recognized and under-treated, and we have very effective drugs. And you can see those campaigns began in the 80s, and they still exist today. Those were often funded uh, by pharmaceutical companies. So you can see here is money is flowing to psychiatry to help uh, promote this new story. Next. Here's the other thing that happened. Who has the who do we look in our society to be the truth tellers about any medical discipline? The doctors at prestigious medical centers. They are the people who are seen as up on a pedestal. Barbara said when you get to when you move from covering politics to science. What happens is, when you cover science, uh, politics, and business, you go into every interview expecting that they will be lying to you. And so you're ordered to be, I, I'm being a bit sensitive, but you're skeptical, okay? You, you, know, you know that people have an agenda. When you, the minute you become a science reporter, they basically say you're gonna be talking to God, and they know and you don't, and just try to interpret whatever they're saying for the public. You're really not seen as uh, capable of being skeptical about what they're telling. Okay. So, what did the pharmaceutical industry do? They began co-opting the uh, what are known as the thought leaders in our society, these, med these psychiatrists and academic medical centers. And you know what really agreed this? It was the industry-funded symposium. Because the way they had approached those doctors, they said, you're so smart, you're the leader, I need you to give a presentation. So they're actually, the, the person giving the presentation doesn't, really think they're being bought, right? But they are being bought. And it's easy to see that once this money starts flowing into academic medicine, they start telling the pharmaceuticals a story. Okay, and this is just some examples that's really that came from Grassley that you can see about what sort of money are we talking about. Well, Joseph Peterman, he was a professor at Harvard Medical School. Now, he helped open up two markets with the pharmaceutical companies. First, a stimulants for ADHD, and then antipsychotics for juvenile bipolar disorder. So he was, and just one company alone uh, gave him 1.6 million dollars over seven years. He is has a, a, a quote, relationships with 23 different companies. Uh, Frederick Goodwin, he's a former director of the NIMH. What he helped GlaxoSmithKline had a new mood stabilizer, uh, Lamictal. Uh, and he helped open up the market for that. He was paid 1.2 million. Uh, this is a woman who helped open up the um, a pediatric market for an antipsychotic. She got paid for 100,000 over four years. And uh, this was antidepressants. Opened up the pediatric market for antidepressants, 160,000. So we're not talking about minor money. We're talking about a lot of money. And these are going to be the people who shape our understanding. And next, let's see if I have this here. So what do these people do? Well, first of all, they set the diagnostic boundaries. Second of all, they conduct, well, they don't really conduct them, but they author uh, reports on clinical trials. They're seen as the ones conducting them. They're actually conducted by the drug companies, analyzed, and they sign off on them. So we see this clinical research is coming from people with medical school expertise. They author those articles. Then they go around and they speak about the validity and the efficacy of the treatment at scientific symposiums, CME courses, in other words, to the profession. They set the clinical practice guidelines, they write the psychiatric textbooks, and they're quoted by reporters as the experts in the field. What society sees are experts in researching ADHD, experts in schizophrenia, experts in bipolar coming from our most prestigious medical schools, and they don't really know about this money flowing to the people. 
Now, by 19, just to see how much they co-opted academic psychiatry, in 1998, the New England Journal of Medicine wanted to do a review of the efficacy of antidepressants, which is sort of an overall review, so they looked for an expert in depression who could do the review, and basically they couldn't find one who wasn't taking money from the drug companies. And they get paid to be consultants, and they get paid to be um, you know, speakers, they serve on speaker bureaus, so this, basically what happened is academic psychiatry got bought. Okay, next. So I went to the 2008 annual meeting of the APA. I had, I was rough getting allowed in. Uh, but anyway, by this time they had a disclosure thing. People had to say whether they had a kind of, any of the speakers had to say whether they were getting money from pharmaceutical companies. So I went through the disclosures. And of 373 speakers, they had a total of 888 consulting agreements and 483 agreements to serve in speakers' bureaus. Now, if you're a speaker bureau, you're basically like a, someone telling you, use this drug. You see how comprehensive this is? Next. So this was a guy, Daniel Carlet, who was a speaker for a while, and then he realized the minute he didn't say what they were supposed to say, he stopped getting speaker uh, gigs. Um, so what is he, he wrote in 2007, and I'll read this for you that can't see. Our field as a whole is progressively being purchased, lock, stock, and barrel by the drug companies. This includes the diagnoses, the treatment guidelines, and the national meetings. Okay, next. So, what I've done so far is just, I hope to sh show that there, there were these economies of influence that sprung up with the SM3. One was an internal one, a desire for... American psychiatry to present itself in a form of an image, which so coincided with pharmaceutical interests, and then they began finding this. Okay? So these are going to be influences that are at least going to want to shape a story about these are validated diseases uh, and the drugs are very effective. Okay? Now, just the fact that there are those influences doesn't mean this, the association has been corrupted. Now, you have to look at the behavior. So what we're going to look at are, are sort of key elements of that narrative. First of all, are mental disorders due to chemical imbalances? Okay, that's what's promoted. I'll show you the promotion. If this is true, it tells of an extraordinary medical advance. This would be like the greatest discovery of the 20th century. If you really discovered that madness was due to one molecule and depression was due to a different one. Did this influence affect the setting of diagnostic boundaries? And remember how important that is. That's where you're determining who is going to be part, element, sort of drawn into that system. And how did it affect the reporting of results from trials of psychiatric drugs? Okay, so these are two big things. And what we're going to look at is how it was reported to the public, and then what their science says. Very simple exercise. Okay, next. So what you see right after, uh, and, and I guess I'll go ahead and read that for those of you who can't see this. Um, Right after DSM-3 is published, we began to hear of a great discovery. And that is, they're discovering that uh, depression and schizophrenia are caused by chemical imbalances in the brain which can be fixed by the drugs. 19, and I'm just going to read these, okay? And you'll see that they're coming from people with authority in our society. University of Chicago psychiatrist Herbert Meltzer in an interview with Associated Press 1981. Researchers believe clinical depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. Now, I could give you one for every year, okay? But I'm just sort of picking out to show how constant this. 1988, antidepressants restore the chemical imbalance scientists have linked to many depressions. That's John Talbot, former president of the American Psychiatric Association in an interview with the St. Petersburg Times. You see I'm talking about people at the top of this association, okay? Next, this is just an ad placed in the New York Times by pharmaceutical companies. It says, scientists now know, no that the causes of schizophrenia and psychosis are often rooted in powerful chemicals in the brain called neurotransmitters. One of these neurotransmitters is dopamine. Schizophrenia and psychosis can result when the brain has abnormal dopamine levels. Because of recent advances, drugs that are able to alter dopamine levels free many patients from the terrible effects of mental illness. Next, just going through the years. 1999. Convention, this is from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Conventional antipsychotics all do about the same job in the brain. They all correct brain chemistry by working on the dopamine systems in the brain. The newer medications, these are the atypicals, Zyprexa, Risperol, and all, 
uh, seem to do a better job of balancing all of the brain chemicals, including dopamine and serotonin. So they're putting uh, your brain chemistry back into harmony. That's basically the message. 2001, this is a head, uh, this was a series of articles in Family Circle of Medicine by AP. AP President Richard Harding, he writes, we now know that mental illnesses, such as depression or schizophrenia, are not moral weaknesses or imagined about real diseases caused by abnormalities of brain structure and imbalances of chemicals in the brain. Next. 2001, another article, same thing, by the present, future president, antidepressants restore brain chemistry to normal. Now in 2005, the APA uh, surveyed the population, conducted a survey to see how many people uh, uh, understood this new message that these drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain. And you'll see, and we'll get to this, they say, it's good. The population has learned that this is true. And the only problem is they don't yet know that we're the specialists in fixing brain chemistry. And so you'll see they put out an accompanying press release to that survey. A psychiatrist is a specialist specifically trained to diagnose and treat chemical imbalances, like infectious disease, uh, then the APA, as one of its new sort of uh, educational things, began putting out these Let's Talk About Mental Illnesses brochures that they put around the country. This was their Let's Talk Facts About Depression. Antidepressants may be prescribed to correct the balances and levels of chemicals in the brain. And just to show you, you can still see this today, 2014. Research has shown that imbalance in neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine can be corrected with antidepressants. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Now, I, I don't want to be picking on the National Alliance on Mental Illness, but they've had a, a, a very, uh, they've been very effective as a storyteller in our society, as seen as a, a very uh, trustworthy uh, story of what we've learned, okay? Next. So, now we have to ask, now we're gonna go to the science. Did they find that depression was due to low serotonin that was then corrected by the drug? Did they find that schizophrenia was due to too much dopamine that's then corrected by the drug? And real quickly, how did this hypothesis arise? The, hy the chemical imbalance the theory of mental disorders, uh, it's a valid hypothesis. It actually arises in the 60s when they begin to understand how the drugs act on the brain. So how do, neurotrans how do neurons communicate in the brain? You have a presynaptic neuron that releases a seeding neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron, and that's how messages get passed, in essence, from one neuron to the next. And then after that binding happens, the brain has to have a way to end that messaging. And that neurotransmitter is taken back up. It's, it's removed from that gap in one of two ways. Either the molecule goes back into the presynaptic neuron and is stored for later reuse, or an enzyme comes along, metabolizes the neurotransmitter, and it's carted off as waste. Okay? So researchers said, well, if we're seeing that an antidepressant ups serotonergic activity, uh, just to go with the, form, the one we're most uh, familiar with, so what does an SSRI do? What does Prozac do? What does Paxil do? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It blocks that normal reuptake of serotonin from the synaptic cleft. Serotonin stays longer in that space and therefore is seen as upping serotonergic activity. See that? So that becomes the mechanism of action, and now they have to see, well, do people with depression, before they go on the drug, do they have low serotonin? So the theory is they do, because it seems they get better, right? We know that's the mechanism of action. Maybe the disease is the opposite. And the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia arises the same way. The drugs are understand, come to be known to block dopamine receptors, <laughs> They lower dopamine activity, so maybe schizophrenia is due to too much dopamine activity. See how that's done? So they began, I'm just going to start with the serotonergic thing. They began investigating this in the 1970s. I don't really have time, in fact, I'm running way behind here, uh, to, to explain how this happened. But in 1983, they basically said, um, we're not finding that before people go on these drugs, that they have anything abnormal with their serotonergic system. Okay, and you'll see this, this is in 1984. Okay, we're just not likely to see it. Next. So there's, you know, Prozac comes to market in 1987. There's a lot of new ways to study serotonergic function, but they all don't pan out. Before people go on the medications, depressed patients, they just don't find a, what's called a lesion or an abnormality in the serotonergic system. Now, 
you're probably lucky over there you can't read this. Uh, but basically, what this is, it's from the American Psychiatric Association's own textbook in 1999, where they declare the serotonin hypothesis dead. We didn't find it. This is in their own textbook. Now, we just went through what they were telling to the public, right? And just the, the thing that, and they, they even make fun of it. They say this. This first part is they're saying this is how it arose from understanding how the drugs act on the brain. And then they say, however, inferring neurotransmitter pathophysiology from an observed action of a class of medications on neurotransmitter availability is similar to concluding that because aspirin causes gastrointestinal bleeding, headaches are caused by too much blood loss. And the therapeutic action of aspirin in headaches involves blood loss. They're making fun of their own theory. And then they say, additional experience has not confirmed the monoamine, serotonin is a monoamine hypothesis. You see what we're doing here? This is what their own science said, even while they were telling a different message. Next. Alan Frazier was someone who began investigating the serotonin hypothesis all the way back in the 70s. He was interviewed by NPR in 2012, and he says this, I don't think there's any convincing body of the data that anybody has ever found that depression is associated to a significant extent with loss of serotonin. And now next, this, I don't have time to go through the whole dopamine story, it's a bit more complicated, where they're seeing if there's maybe subsets of people with psychosis that have some sort of temporary dopamine um, sort of up -reg regulation real briefly. But, Stephen Hyman, he's a uh, former director of the NIMH, he's a neuroscientist, in his book, Molecular Psychiatry 2002, he says of the dopamine hypothesis, there is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. So this is the dopamine hypothesis, basically, that he put the day. Now, this man, Kenneth Kendler, was one of, seen as one of the world experts on the hunt for chemical imbalances, okay? Co-editor-in-chief of Psychological Medicine. So in 2005, he looks back at this long search for chemical imbalances and he concludes, we have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders and have not found them. This is the science, okay? The first was the, what the public was being told. This is the science. Next, this is my favorite quote. So Ronald Pies is a former editor-in-chief of Psychiatric Times. And by this time in 2011, everyone agrees the chemical imbalance in the scientific field has fallen apart, okay? it didn't pan out. So now psychiatry's in a bit of an embarrassment, right? Because they've told this story, and the science told it didn't happen. So now they're saying we never said it. <laughs> he says, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, Never a theory seriously propounded by well propounded by well informed psychiatrists. Now here's the irony of this. There's a grain of truth in this. Well, oh, by the way, you've got to read this. He blames this whole misinformation on people like me who claim they said this about chemical imbalances. Oh, this is just something that people don't like to say. Well, you know, you can just go through all the things and they're still saying. But I was given a grand rounds at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital uh, shortly after anatomy and epidemic came out, and it was a pretty hostile audience. And they actually had someone then to come up and say where the book was wrong. And the guy says, and remember, he says, you know what, you raised a straw man argument. You said that, you know, that we told people that they had chemical imbalances in the brain. He said, That's, that theory died 25 years ago. And so I said, because really it did, if you look at the research. You're right. It did die scientifically 25 years ago. It really was being put to bed in the 80s. I said, I'm pretty sure you forgot to inform the American public. <laughs> <laughs> and there were a lot of heads that went up and down. <laughs> Next. So, you do surveys now. 87% of Americans now know that schizophrenia is caused by chemical imbalance. 80% of Americans said they now know that depression is caused by chemical imbalance. Now, this is not a harmless understanding. This is telling you what you have to do, right? You need to take the medication. It also is saying that mental illness is chronic. You can't recover from this. You have an illness that's persistent. You have a broken brain. You're abnormal. So you've got to be a patient for life, in essence. 
And by the way, in, we had fewer than 1% of our population on antidepressants in 1987. I can't even quite keep up with it, but it's over 10% now. So that just tells you. So this is a part of that narrative that tells of psychiatry making great progress in understanding biology and mental health Great progress in its drugs, because drugs that fix some unknown pathology are generally, that's a good uh, formula for an effective drug, saying that the drugs are doing something and it's not true. So when I came out here this morning saying that one of the problems is we've organized ourselves around a certain narrative, we have organized ourselves for a long time around the chemical imbalance narrative. So this is part one. Next. Now we just want to see. Uh, when we talk about, Barbara said, 20% of the population has mental illness each year. 20, actually, I think sometimes they now say it's 30 years. Well, it all depends on how you define mental illness. And if you keep expanding the boundaries, yeah, you'll fit into one of the DSM categories. But that's what we're talking about when we say that 20% or 25% or 30%. They fit within one of these constructive categories. Next. So, Lisa Cosgrove, who was the partner that I wrote uh, Psychiatry and Influence with, one of the things she did is she went and looked at the people who constructed DSM-4 and constructed DSM-5, and there's two parts to that. There's an overall tax force, and then people work on the individual, like anxiety disorders, etc. And you'll see on the task force, the majority had ties to pharmaceutical companies. Some of the individual work panels, it's schizophrenia, everyone did. Others, it's 100%, 83, 81. And actually, this is low because it just meant they had gotten rid of their uh, connection in, like, the, the, while they were on the task force. Okay? They had it before, but they'll, they'll have it afterwards. And then you'll see with DSM-5, um, it's, it's the same sort of thing. Okay, next. And as we go through DSM-4, you'll see we keep expanding the boundaries for getting diagnosed. We went from 265 to 297, so we have 32 more. You see diagnostic criteria loosened up. This is what really uh, expands the market, makes it easier and easier to... And my favorite thing in the DSM is, if you don't meet the diagnostic criteria for psychosis or depression, you can always have... Well, if you don't meet it, you can still get diagnosed <laughs> category, right? Not otherwise specifying. Um, so this is when you hear this. Based on DSM-4, we now have 26% of Americans experiencing mental illness each year, 13%. I would say this is the identification of a market for, for pharmaceutical companies. That's what you're really seeing here. Next. So one of the things that happened with anxiety disorders, Prozac comes out and it really, you know, in 1987, and it really begins to, you know, becomes a very popular drug. And by the time Paxil came up, there was a sense of, by Smith, Klein, <coughs> Beecham, that the market for SSRIs for depression was pretty flooded. And they wanted to identify a new market. And they wanted to they wanted to market Paxo as the drug for anxiety. Okay? Because they thought the depressive market was already taken up. So, you see these guys? They're all the people on the work group for DSM-4 that are going to say what are the symptoms of various anxiety disorders like PTSD and um, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, general anxiety disorder, which are going to be newly marketed. They're on the DSM-4 panel. Then as they're on that panel, Smith Klein invites them to a meeting and starts paying them okay, to be advisors, consultants. Then uh, they give them Paxil to test for one of the disorders they've just done, and they all say Paxil's great for that. And then they become the speakers that say uh, Paxil's a very good drug for these anxiety disorders. What I'm saying here is in this chart, you can see how a market is created. From diagnosis, to uh, studies, to uh, promotion around the world. Okay, next. This is just going, we have new disorders, premenstrual dysphoric disorder in DSM-5, binge eating disorder, disrupt, you know, just what's going, right. hoarding disorder, et cetera, et cetera, mild dis <laughs> neurocognitive disorder for adults. You've all heard about the expanded criteria for making a diagnosis of depression. If you grieve more than two weeks after you lost a spouse or a kid, you're mentally ill. And all I have to say is, I don't think these people read Shakespeare or a single novel. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, that's, and it's seen as an illness, okay? It's like grieving as it's out of proportion. Okay, next. 
Real quickly, ADHD. We have about 13% of our kids now diagnosed with ADHD. How did this happen? Prior to 1980, there was no diagnosis called attention deficit disorder. They were using stimulants. They began to use them in the 70s for uh, minimal brain dysfunction. Okay? But one of the problems they now have is they're beginning to prescribe stimulants really just to quiet the kids in the classroom in the 70s. Now they need a diagnosis for it. Some of you who were five once, can you identify this? You can raise your hand. <laughs> And they said that uh, as many as 3%, it's 3% have. Then 1994, they, 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 they expand the ability to make a diagnosis of ADAD. They say it's three subtypes. In it, so now you can just be inattentive. You don't even really have to be hyperactive. And there's inattentive only, hyperactive, impulsive only, and those have both types, three types of ADHD. And now they say it's 5%, 3 to 5%, so we're upping it. Next. Now, this man, Joseph Biederman at Massachusetts General Hospital, who had been a member of the diagnostic group for DSM-4 for ADHD, he now begins a publishing record that I think is unequaled in science. He begins publishing a, a new article about every two weeks, and his articles basically say this, it's a real disease, it's been validated, um, and you better give these kids drugs or they're going to grow up and have horrible outcomes. And that becomes the message. He becomes quoted by the New York Times. Now he says it's 6 to 9 percent. We further loosen the boundaries, and now we're at 13 percent. My point is you can trace uh, the expansion of the boundaries. And through Biederman's articles, you can, you can trace the promotion of the idea. It's a validated disorder. If you deny it, you're sort of a flat earth person. And then if you do not give your kids stimulants, they're going to grow up and have horrible lives. And he says it's research. And by the way, I tracked his number of articles. So he starts this sort of publishing flurry in 1995. And he began publishing a, a new article every two weeks. And he kept that up for 15 years. So he's really an extraordinarily productive fellow. OK, next. Here's his payoff. So from these 15 years, as he was helping building these two markets, he received the speaker's fees, consulting fees, and research funding from more than 24 pharmaceutical companies. You see all the companies that make the ADHD drugs, and that one alone paid him 1.6 million. Um, and just to so, sort of see how this gets reified, next, we're going to now move on to the drug information. There's a new book out by New York Times uh, ADHD, um, a New York Times reporter named Alan Schwartz. And here's what he says. ADHD is being overdiagnosed. Okay, and that's being now accepted a little bit in the common manner. But the book begins this way. ADHD is real, and don't let anyone convince you otherwise. So actually, he's fitting that within the conventional narrative. Because we still don't have a blood test for ADHD. You can see it's constructed. It's a behavioral thing that we're talking about. And actually, I could go into this. You might see that, oh, they have different brains, right? You all heard this? They do studies of ADHD kids. They have different brains. Well, actually, the APA convened a task force on this, and they said, we have a problem. These are studies being done in medicated kids. We don't know if this uh, drug action is different because of the medication, and there basically haven't been any good studies of unmedicated kids, but that part is never told to us. Okay, real quick, quickly, because I'm running behind. Next. We want to see if financial influences affect what is told to the public about the efficacy of drugs. One of the first new drugs to come to market post DSM-3 is Alprazolam, you know it as Xanax, for panic disorder. Panic disorder also is a newly constructed disorder. It was always just seen as part of the symptom of anxiety before. It's its own disorder in 1980. Once it gets its, uh, its new own disorder, you can now test for it. The FDA will now say they have, if you can get it approved, a, a drug for that disorder, okay? So, it gets tested. You'll see these are the number of panic attacks per week in the placebo group and the Xanax group. Okay, you see this? By the way, the placebo group is not a placebo group. It's actually a group that's being yanked off drugs, just so you know this. But now let's look at what happens after week four. Which group is doing better? You can't see, but the Xanax group has greater improvement in uh, symptoms, right? Drug works. Y'all see that? Okay, and so this is the message that's going to be promoted to the public. The problem is it was not a four-week study. Next slide. This is the actual results from the study. It was an eight-week study, and in eight weeks there was no significant difference in the number of panic attacks between the Xanax and the placebo groups. 
But more importantly, when this was being done, everybody understood that benzodiazepines were addictive. They should not be taken long term, so you needed to have a withdrawal arm and see how successfully people could withdraw from the drug treatment. And look what happened to the Xanax patients when they were withdrawn, which starts here at, at week eight. You see where they are at by week 13? They're worse off than baseline. And actually, I forget the percentage, but a high percentage could not get off. That they had so many withdrawal symptoms. So what you really saw in this study was a drug that was going to addict people and trap people in addiction, and they wouldn't be able to get off. That's what you saw. Now, which one did get promoted to the American public? and to the profession. Go back one. This is the result you read about in the abstract. Next. This, I actually put this graph together from their data. It's not like they have a graphic like this, but you, they actually give you the data for the number of panic attacks and table, and they don't discuss it. But I just use that data to build this graphic. And my point is this. You, the public, and you need all the information. That's what I'm saying. I don't care what people do with their lives. That's me. <laughs> but you, we, the public, deserve the information. And you deserve the information. Next. So, what happened? Because they promoted the first? This. <laughs> you know, it's Arizona. Uh, I, <laughs> Many years ago, I was speaking in Arizona at a big conference, <laughs> Alternative Conference. You know, the conference, there's this thunderstorm, the mic quits, and people say, God speaking, don't want you to talk. <laughs> anyway, it's only Arizona. Um, so, what have the news media put? So, this new treatment helps 70 to 90% of those with panic disorder, okay? And the headline was, in a panic, help is on the way. And then, associated percents. Here we go with the chemical balance chart. A biochemical malfunction in the brain is believed to be one of the causes, not pain attacks, I can't write, panic attacks. Xanax can block the attacks by interacting with several different systems in the brain. This is a, an anecdote story. So you, you saw the research. What you saw is a story of a drug that was addicted. Now how many of you know of Xanax patients that have got addicted to the drug? Okay, that was in there in 1980, but it wasn't promoted. Okay, next. Okay, real quickly, assessment of stimulants, since we're medicating sort of our kids. We began doing it in the 70s, um, and one of the questions, are we helping these kids grow up and thrive? In 1994, the APH textbook of psychiatry says, at this point, we have no evidence that stimulants produce lasting improvements in aggressivity, conduct disorder, criminality, education achievement, job functioning, marital relationships, or long-term adjustment. So, 14 years into the dsm 3 era, we did not have, the studies had not shown long-term benefit. Now what happens is Biederman's going to start saying there is, but he's actually not conducting long-term experiments. Next. So they mount the NIMH, your dollars help pay for the first national, the first what they call well-designed study of stimulants over a long period of time as a treatment for ADHD. And they say this is going to be the trial that determines how we use these drugs and what we know about these drugs, okay? And you'll see, at outset, the investigators wrote that the long-term efficacy of stimulant medication has not been demonstrated for any domain of child function, okay? We do not have evidence for helping these kids. Okay, here was the, the in my opinion, the trial was biased by design, but well, I won't go into that. You have four different, the random kids are randomized into four groups. Either uh, behavioral therapy, uh, uh, root, uh, excuse me, medication alone, okay, that's just stimulants. And it's medication alone prescribed either by experts in the field or by community doctors. So there's two different medication groups. There's a behavioral therapy, behavioral therapy, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> I must have been drunk last night. <laughs> Here were the four arms, okay? There is medication alone as prescribed by people in the community. There's medication alone as prescribed by uh, experts. There is behavioral therapy alone, and then we have medication plus behavioral therapy. Okay, those are the four. Next. So, 14 month results this is what you re 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 read. At the end of 14 months, carefully crafted medication management, that means by the experts in the field, not the community doctors, had proven to be superior to behavioral treatment in terms of reducing core ADHD symptoms. And there's a hint that medicated children also did better on reading tests. And this is the finding that says, we're providing a long-term benefit, okay? 
They say, since ADHD is now regarded by most experts as a chronic disorder, ongoing treatment often seems necessary. They finally have evidence the stimulants are beneficial. Okay, you see that? Okay, next. This study did not end at 14 months. After 14 months, it just becomes a naturalistic study. Everybody's free to do whatever they want. If you've been on drug, you can go off. If you haven't been on drug, you can go on. Okay? And now they're just going to follow them. And at the end of three years, here's what they said in the abstract. I'm going to read you the abstract, and then I'm going to see what you sh find in the, the, the actual meat of the paper. By 36 months, the earlier advantage of having had 14 months of the medication algorithm was no longer apparent possibly due to age-related decline in ADHD symptoms, changes in medication management intensity, starting or stopping medication altogether, or other factors. What they're saying here in the abstract is there's no longer a benefit. Okay? It's not that they're doing worse on drug, but there's no longer a benefit seen in the drug maintained kids. Okay? That's the abstract. Here's actually what happened, if you really read it. Next. In the paper, if you read carefully, at the end of 36 months, medication use was a significant marker, not of beneficial outcome, but of deterioration. That is, participants using medication in the 24 to 36 month period actually showed increased symptomatology during the interval relative to those not taking medication. Medication children were also slightly smaller and had higher delinquency scores. Why isn't this in the abstract? Go read the NIMH press release, not in there. In fact, the NIMH press release says, ah, oh, you're okay. Maybe the benefit disappeared, but we still know these drugs work. But this was the finding. And they had a big fight, in fact, not to even mention this. It's a fight among the investigators where they should even mention this. Six year results. Next. In the abstract, no significant differences between the medicated youth and the unmedicated youth at the end of six and eight years. Read the paper closely. Next. At the end of six years, medication use was associated with worse hyperactivity, impulsivity, and oppositional defiant disorder symptoms, and with greater overall functional impairment. They are also most likely to be depressed and anxious. It's a negative. Not in the abstract, not in the NIMH, not promoted in textbooks. Next, what, are, what is the public told your kid? Your kid has, gets diagnosed with ADHD, what are you told? 14 month results. This is how you know the drugs work. Give your kids stimulants because we have this trial and at 14 months. This is from today. They don't tell the three year results, they don't tell the six year results. And I'm going to tell you about my same appeal. Okay? It's you just deserve the information. I think I got about five, ten minutes, right? I need to. Ten, okay. So we're gonna, okay. You skip this, but basically, if you remember the Prozac story that was worried that uh, Prozac caused homes, uh, suicidal impulses in kids, then the NIMH mounted a trial which was done by investigators with close ties to the maker of antidepressants, and they conclude that there's no excess risk in, in drug versus placebo. And you can see they report the number of suicidal attempts were the same whether you were on drug or off drug. You see that? Here's the actual data. This is the conclusion, no evidence of medication-induced behavioral activization as a precursor. Actual data, 17 of the suicide attempts were on drug, one on placebo. What happened is the way they did this, if you were randomized to drug, at 12 weeks they put everybody on drug, and so if you're randomized to placebo, and then you commit suicide, uh, make a suicide attempt after going on 12 weeks, they assigned it to placebo. And that's how they hid all the results, okay? By the way, I know moms who put their kids on pros after their kids die. Next, you'll see same thing, the guys who did the study had ties to the makers of Prozac. Next, finally this thing is long-term outcome studies. When they produce results that don't fit with the narrative, you don't hear them. And I can get through this in about five minutes. So, the best long-term study we have with schizophrenia patients and psychotic patients was done by Martin Harrell at the University of Illinois. Beginning in the late 70s, early 80s, he recruits 200 psychotic patients into a study that recruited from one private hospital, one uh, public hospital, he gets a, a diverse mix. It's naturalistic. Everybody treated with drugs, they're discharged, and now he's just going to follow them at two, four and a half, seven and a half, ten, fifteen, twenty 20 years, and see how they're doing. Are they in recovery? Uh, are they taking medications? Are they working? That sort of thing. This is the best long-term study done in, the, in anywhere in the past, in the, in the pharmaceutical era. His hypothesis is that those who go off the drugs will do terrible. Okay, because his hypothesis comes from common wisdom. You go off the drugs, you do terrible. Right? Now, one of the things that's amazing about this study, if any of you have done research related to people diagnosed with schizophrenia, it's hard to keep them in the study. 
At 15 years, he still had 77% of his 200 patients in the study, 145, which is an extraordinary result of its own. So at the end of two years, he, had, he ended up with 64 uh, patients diagnosed with schizophrenia and 81 with mild or psychotic disorders. Sort of depression with psychotic features, mania with psychotic features, okay? And at the end of two years, about 25 of the patients had stopped taking their antipsychotics, okay? About well, 20, I think it was, 20 out of the 64. And about 20% were in recovery versus 8% of those on drug. And to be in recovery, you had to be asymptomatic and you had to be working or in school half of the time. So there was a functional recovery. You had to have a pretty decent social, some sort of uh, good social. So they're off, they're on, not that much difference. What happens between year two and four and a half? This is the off med group. What happens? There's a lot of healing that goes on. And this is the only place in the research literature where you see people who suffered a schizophrenic time really recovering because we don't follow them from two to four and a half years. This is showing that something that show, doesn't show up in any other place in the literature is this healing that is possible long term. Okay, and you'll see it stays that way. The recovery rate, which we're supposed to want, is eight times higher. It's 40% versus 5% at the end of 15 years. This was not published result in any American newspaper because they didn't promote it. The reason they didn't promote you know why they didn't promote it? Because it went against the narrative. The only reason the arrow studies get known now is because really of anatomy and epidemic started putting on that. Next. See here, at this is schizophrenia patients again, 64. They're both anxious at the end of two years. The off group, med group, and the, this is a lot of anxiety. Anxiety is associated with bad outcomes, but look what happens. The off med group, the anxiety abates. The on med group, it increases and becomes almost persistent. And if you look, look at the research, as they said, they're worried about a persistent tardive of akathisia, it's inner agitation. Okay, so that's a symptom. Next, cognitive function, it's better for those um, off medications and every follow-up. Next. Now he, at the end of 15 years, he divides his outcomes into three groups, recovered, so-so, uniformly poor. So for the group off medications, it's 40% recovered, 44% so-so, 16% uniformly poor. For those who are on medications, it's only 5% recovery, 46% fair, 49% uniformly poor. What it shows is that the spectrum of outcomes is being shifted along a chronic, more non-functional course. Now, again, I'm gonna go back to the same thing. I just say you need to know this data and then we can discuss it. What does it mean? What are its implications? It just needs to be part of the evidence base, and it's not, because it goes against common wisdom. Next. Now here, we all know you can't come off your drugs or you'll become psychotic, right? And that's why we have laws that say you gotta take your drugs. But there is in the research literature actually a worry that arose in the 70s that the drugs themselves uh, induce a biological change that makes people more vulnerable to psychosis, okay? That came out in the 70s. It's known as the dopamine supersensitive hypothesis. This, in the essence, is a confirmation of it. So, at two years, the group off is psychotic. They come off and they're psychotic. They're not doing so well. If you were to look at them and say, see, hey, they gotta take drugs. This group is also psychotic, but you know, they're taking drugs. Look what happens again, the psychosis abates. We're down to only a quarter uh, actively psychotic, right? And by the way, this is, he's taking data here. These are the medication compliant patients throughout the 15 years. Actually, it's 20 years. These are the people who got off at two years and never took it again. And they left the system. These people disappeared, actually. They said, I don't want to do with psychiatry. And you know what he found? Some of these people, they disappeared back into society. One became a lawyer, several became teachers, that sort of thing. And as he said, as we followed them up, nobody went around saying, ah, you know, I used to have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. They disappear. But you see this healing? And you don't see the control of the very symptom the drugs are supposed to control. We never hear this. There's no laws in the United States that are, that are based on this. Next. One minute and a half. <laughs> okay. Here's the work history. They were, there was a lot of people working. Okay. These people had working half time or more. It was, at some point it was 90%. Here it was much less. Next. Anybody hear this? What did the researcher conclude? From the best long-term study, Martin Harrow, he says, I conclude that patients with schizophrenia not on antipsychotic medication for a long period of time have significantly better global functioning than those on antipsychotics. 
All of you have read, heard that other than through what written, reading something I wrote? Raise your hands. Did you read it in your newspaper? Did you read it in your psychiatric textbooks? You don't. This is the problem. It's got to be part of the information. Next. This is just a uh, study of untreated depression. Six year study. You'll see that those who took antidepressants were three times more likely to have a cessation of role function and six times more likely to become incapacitated, go on disability. Again, my point is you need to know this. It's never, it's never um, promoted. Next. So. You can just stop this. So what's the social engineering? There's a lot of social engineering. A, we've been given a false philosophy of being, that these chemicals control our moods and that sort of thing. We've been encouraged to pathologize our kids, right? Say you have a known illness and treat them with stimulants when in fact we don't have evidence that's helping those kids grow up. We, we're not providing informed consent to patients, right? We're not allowed to lie to people and say they have a, a known problem without it. We have the societal delusion, we pass each laws for medication compliance, and then we have a mounting, since this we adopted this paradigm of care, we have a mounting burden of mental illness in our society. I think we have an impoverished philosophy of being, and we have organized ourselves around a false story. And just the burden of illness real quickly, next, and then I'm off at 10.30, which I think is when I was, you guys just didn't get to ask questions. <laughs> This is the number of people, adults on disability, since Prozac was introduced, it was 1.25 million in our country. This is receiving SSI or SSDI. Now we're at 2009, and we're actually getting close to 5 million adults on disability. Next. This is children. We begin, you know, really begin pathologizing children with arrival of Prozac. Well, it really begins earlier. In 1988, we had something like 12,000 children receiving an SSI payment because they were disabled by a mental illness. And you'll see now we're close to 800,000. And if you fall those kids to age 18, about two-thirds go on to adult disability. So what you really see in this data is a new career path we've opened up for some of our children where they get de designated as mentally ill as kids and they become adult mental patients. That's what you see here. The final thing is this is happening in every country that has adopted this paradigm of care. I recently was asked to go to uh, talk to a work group in Parliament in the UK because they're saying, why are we seeing these rising disability rates in country after country that has adopted a uh, increased use of these medications, which seemingly they're supposed to fix some bio bi biological problem. And normally, when you do that, when you identify a pathology of a disease and give an antidote to that disease, that burden of that illness that, uh, uh, diminishes exact policies. So what I think our whole society has a challenge now of rethinking what we know about mental disorders, how best to help people, and almost to start anew. Because we have gone down a path of commerce, a story told, shaped by commerce and not by science. And the final thing is, there is in the scientific literature, if we start rethinking things anew, a story of great optimism summed up by a man named Samuel Bachoven in the 1950s. He said, I think most mental disorders, especially the most severe, are episodic in nature unless we do something to turn them chronic. And that's, I think, is the uh, message of hope that is to be rediscovered. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert.